Fully just start this presentation. Thanks everyone for um, coming to this presentation about the wildlife trade in China. My name is Hong Ying Li and uh, I'm the China Program Coordinator at EcoHealth Alliance. And we have actually initiated this work in China two years ago uh, with the aim to protect the health of human and animals because as you may know wildlife trade is one of the main interfaces for human animal contacts which brings about a lot of risk of zoonotic diseases transmitted from animal to human beings. So it has been a very slow process with a lot of thinking and exploration trying to understand the wildlife trade in China. The more we know, the more we want to know. And myself got confused sometimes, but we're working on it. And today I'm presenting some of the preliminary results from our research in China. Hope, hopefully we can give you an overview about the wildlife trade in China. So when we talk about the wildlife trade, what's the first thing you will think of? For me, it's... It's every, because it's a very, it's on the news everywhere. It's not just trade, it's an international crime. And it has been a part of the culture for many countries, in many countries for hundreds of years. And also the rhino horse. Um, the, Af the population of African rhino has dramatically declined for 96% just because of a large scale poaching. And the tiger, you cannot imagine how people believe those tigers can give men the power like tigers. And the pangolins, the most trafficked mammal in the world for medicine and for lottery food. And uh, even animals in the ocean cannot escape from the destiny. Imagine each of those things is a life of a shark. And if you have ever heard about this, recently this hermited hobby, the birds become very popular for collections. It's terrible. Unfortunately, most of those animal products, not all of them, but most, go to one country, China. And I put two question marks there because even China has been taking the blame about the wildlife trade, the consumption. However, as all of the commercial products, those valuable products will naturally go to places where they are buying powers. Actually, um, countries like the US and the European country and the Japan are also very big consumer of products like tiger bow, tiger skin, and ivory. So what do we do? Because China is doing badly about the wildlife trade. So this is a summary about the policy in China related to wildlife trade. I'm not going to very detailed and we will share this slide, you can look at it. But the key message here is, even though they claim they have taken actions to combat wildlife trade, the government has been focusing on the utilization and the management of wildlife because in a government's perspective, wildlife is just a natural resources, so it should be used and managed. And the forest trade department is the main governor of the wildlife trade business industry, and it's very central power and there's no mechanism you can really see and monitor what's going on under this policy. Outside of the government, there are so many international and local NGOs, they're doing campaigns to reduce the demand of wildlife products because China is the biggest 
consumers in the world. So it makes sense. So this kind of poster can be found any big city like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou by <laughs> with different species and uh, by celebrity singers and collectors. However, what about those? This photo was taken in a wet market in southern China. It's very common. Um, it's interesting to see how many species here. There's a porcupine, there is pangolin scale, and those I believe is the skin of elephant, and those different horse, and those are testicle of the, some ungulates. And they are sold on the market with those herbs as medicine. And this is a pet market in the urban area, and uh, a lot of reptile and wild birds are being hunted and traded in this kind of market. And uh, for the citizen in the city, it's such an entertainment for them to visit this kind of market during the weekend. And if those markets are not wild enough, yes, so we decided to go to the border area and we think uh, it's maybe it may be less regulated. So this is the border between Laos and China. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we didn't find anything in China side. But when we go across the border in Laos, we can see this market everywhere. And uh, just imagine those local people, they have this kind of market every week or every two weeks. So they bring they bring what they got for exchange of the other groceries. So it's with vegetable and the other household groceries. And as mentioned before, supported by the government, well, animal farming is a huge business in China. This is not good because a lot of illegal wildlife trade activities are going on under this cover of legal wildlife farming. So after all of those visits and observations, we came up with our hypothesis about the types of wildlife trade in China. So the first type is, as we showed firstly, those flag species we call like elephant, pangolin, rhino, and they are usually international trade with very well established trade chain with flag species. And the second type is short chain trade. As we saw in uh, the picture, it's locally, it's domestic. It's more opportunist, like if you got those animals you bring to the market, but you're not making living on it. And it's a small scale, but obviously it involves more species. And we think it's may be more risky because we saw a lot of species uh, like rodents and bats traded on the market. And even they're not well known as the flag species, they may be more risky for human health. So we decided to focus on this kind of short chain trade because it's more accessible and uh, risky and interesting for us. So first, we conducted an online survey in China um, last year uh, among more than 2,000 Chinese nationals in 23 provinces. And as we can see, 72% of the participants have been involved in wildlife trade in some certain ways, hunting, buying, eating, slaughtering, um, or using the wildlife products as medicine. And for 30% of them, even they don't eat, they don't hunt, they visited all the pet market as we mentioned before. And it also involves behaviors like handling, playing, contacting wild animals, it's still risky. Of course, in terms of attitude, they say, okay, we should stop 
our activities in wildlife trade because there's a law and because they want to protect animal or because they are afraid of diseases. And they all have very high expectation about the government to take action and they believe the local community and the human should be involved to make a difference. But as you can see, those people uh, participate in the online survey they at least should live in, in the places uh, where there's access to the internet and know how to use the uh, computer. So it may be bias of the population. So at the same time, we also conducted the interviews, um, like 88 interviews in three provinces in China. Uh, in rural area, and those locations were selected because we did animal sampling there, and the population in those locations are considered to have very high exposure to wildlife. So we can see, according to the reports, rodents, bats, and the wild birds are the most hunted and consumed wildlife, and the it's bad because as we know, those species usually carry virus that can infect human beings. And in terms of behavior, there are so many tools are used for catching animals, but the trap or collapse are the most used. Before the gun control policy, they used gun to hunt animal, but after the uh, policy, they still can use homemade bomb to catch animals. And for the net, it's really depend on which species you are catching. And the net are mostly used for bats and the birds uh, for those who can fly. And uh, different from what we thought about wildlife trade, there's no trade. When they got those animals, they would like to eat them at home or share with friends instead of sell out to make money. And then the reason why they don't eat wildlife is different from the online survey we can say. They don't care about law or regulation so much. They are more care about uh, disease or uh, because the wildlife is too expensive to buy so they don't eat wild animals. But there's still a lot of people that believe while well, animal is good for their health. And in the rural area, because there's, there's limited resources of protein, so they regard the wild animal just like protein. It's not luxury food. It's just regular meat they should eat. And almost everyone who have reported eating wildlife mentioned it tastes, tastes better, delicious, tasty, this kind of word. And about the hunting, we can say people, there's no professional or full-time hunter animals in China. They're not hunting for making a live. They hunt for fun with friends. They, go, they went out to the mountain with friends, had fun hunting animals, and by the end of the day, they cook the animal to eat at dinner. Those are the most the reason they hunt. And uh, before, yes, they mentioned before there are a lot of people hunting who are hunting for making a living, but now they may just like opportunist. They are in a farm and they find an animal, they got it, and it's hunting. But the good things we can see here, why they don't hunt anymore because there's strict law and regulation. And also the gun control policy really works to, um, to prevent hunting because they don't have the tools to hunt. Another sad, sad reason is there's few animals can be found in a while so they don't hunt. Okay, this is the uh, interviews. So, because we said the wildlife farming supported by the government, sometimes it just cover up a lot of illegal wildlife trade activities. We decided to conduct a survey about human and wild, wild animal network um, with the farmer we know very well. So we developed this questionnaire. There's three 
components. The first, we conduct we conduct the survey at market and farms. First, we have observation about the environment of the farm or the market and to estimate the value of animals. Then we have interview part. We talk with the farm owner or the vendor to find out specific information about species. And then, then we ask them to provide some contacts who are in those network. And uh, then we go to those contacts to do the same questionnaire to find them more. Eventually, we're hoping we can be able to map out a network about uh, how those animals are treated and how people contact each other for the treating. So the whole idea is our mission is to protect the one health of human, animal, and the environment. And by reducing wildlife traits, we can achieve this goal. And the, our experience told us People may not care about conservation, but they do care about their own health. The first time that Chinese government shut down the wildlife market was during the SARS outbreak. So we believe this is a good angle for us to reduce the wildlife trade by leveraging the public health impact. So uh, we're now uh, characterizing the wildlife trade in China. We have got a lot of uh, questionnaire information to identify the human-animal contacts in the wildlife trade. And uh, we are developing policy recommendation and the behavior change programs um, from the high level to the community-based um, level to um, help reduce the wildlife trade. And as part of the efforts for policy advocacy, we had this wildlife and public health workshop in China last year. That was the first time that the government officials from the um, forestry, agriculture, and the CDC human health department got together to talk about this issue, to talk about how they can work together better to prevent zoonotic diseases. So it was a very successful event, and we hope we can have this workshop biannually, um, which is next year. So there are so many work. We're, we're still exploring, and we're still studying on different issues. And uh, but thanks to our wonderful local team, and uh, we will continue our work. Also thank our founders from USAID Predict Project and the NIAID Project on Coronavirus. So any question and comments are very welcome. Uh, we just got a question about do people who do not eat wildlife in rural area have nutri nutrition something different? Um, we haven't, we never studied on this, but according to my <laughs> observation, no. No, few of them should. Yeah, it's different from the bushmeat. I believe this is a rural area, but the most population in China, they regard the wildlife as a luxury food, not a source of protein. And uh, when they mention this, the source of protein, they mentioned about like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah, I should have said that. What do and another question is, what are the zoonotic diseases you are mostly concerned about from wildlife? Since bats are popular, presumably you are concerned about many virus. Okay, that's a good question. Actually, our, 
our we in China we have different components work. We sampling we sampled animals, which is bats and rodents, and also we sampled human. We got human biological samples, and we do question behavior surveillance. So in China, according to our behavior surveillance, the most human contact with animal are between human and the bats, and the human and the rodents. Uh, there are some preliminary results from our other interviews. The, there are so many bat caves located around the village, so people do visit the village um, for hunting bats or just for fun because it's a cave, it's different, they're curious to see. And their contact with, oh, also there are some people, they reported they consume bats because they also believe bats are good for women's health for some reason. For rodents, it's very popular. It's, it's mostly rats in the houses in the rural area. They reported they have found food touched by rats. And the, if they find food touched by rats, they will feed those food to their dogs or cats. And uh, those is the major contacts between rodents and humans. So those two species are the most concerned for us. So the virus will be coronavirus because um, because the contact between bats and the, in China, like for the bats we sampled in China, there's 10 percentage positive in coronavirus because it, so it's a high risk. Uh, for rodents, it's hunter, hunter virus, I believe, because also according to the surveillance, it's very highly positive in uh, samples. And another question we got is, are there tourism to China to eat those exotic food? Could regulation of exotic wildlife decrease tourism? Um, you mean tourists to go to China or? It's, act it's interesting, it's actually the upside. As I'm, uh, I'm, I show you the picture there, there's no like, Wildlife. There's no wildlife restaurants in the China side, but go across the border, and we also find a lot of restaurants. And interesting, the owner of the restaurants are almost Chinese, and the customer are also Chinese. So they cannot eat wildlife in China. Then they just go across the border to have a bite of a wildlife. So it's, um, which means the regulation actually may not decrease the wildlife trade. It just push, push it to somewhere in other country or underground, which may be more difficult for us to study. Okay, we have another question. Are uh, animals in markets usually warm temperature or ever frozen? The answer is no frozen. It's like warm temperature or it also depends really. Those markets, they're comparatively fresh because they got from the mountain and those markets are very close to the mountain. But there are also cases like frozen birds because they want to transport them and from the rural area to the big city like Beijing, Shanghai. In those cities, what we find is frozen birds and pangolin is also frozen. Another question is, where can I find more information on 
uh, your program and results. Uh, we, uh, first, we will be able to share this slide, and uh, we have our website with the program information about the wildlife trade study in China, not only in China, and also in other Southeast Asia country and Africa. So feel free to explore our website. And I have my uh, contact information, I believe, on the first slides. And if you have any question or interested in our work, please feel free to contact me. Okay, so very happy to share those information. Hope it's not so boring. And uh, contact me if you have any more questions. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.